Hello everyone, welcome to Imprint IS. I'm Baron Kholar and today we're looking at the daily news discovery for the day 21st of November 2018. Right, so let's look at what we'll be covering today. So um, the first topic that we're going to pick up is the SC and ST Atrocities Act and we've also put an imprint challenge that you know if you write an answer on it we'll give a question as well for this. Another question will be given for the first pass the post system versus proposed representation the pros and cons of the, those. Then we'll look at the US China trade war and a little bit of details and in the fact that you know it's the first time that APEC happened and uh, there was not a uh, declaration about that. Then we have the pre-exit deal. Uh, we'll talk about judicial delay as well. We uh, these are I think reoccurring themes, like four or five specifically, right? And then um, we look at in GS3. We look at demonetization and agriculture. Uh, we look at the Sobagya scheme, uh, the RBI saga, and we look at a couple of articles on that. Uh, 3D printing. We look at uh, this is a new topic for you guys. Uh, it has come in prelims and in mains. Uh, prelims question we'll look at uh, here today as well. Then we look at an ethics, uh, you know, article, uh, you know, there's a continuation of articles which will happen till 26th of November in the Indian Express. Uh, that's the idea. Okay, so let's start. So the first topic is the SCNST, Atrocities Act. So uh, the first, you know, article talks about the fact that, you know, the government is saying that it is uh, misconceived and misleading, right? Let's look at what the government is saying. He says, uh, Attorney General K.K. Venugopal, uh, in case you don't know the Attorney General of India's name, is K.K. Venugopal. He says it is misconceived and misleading to suggest that, that acquittals singularly take place owing due to either false cases or misuse of the provincial of accuracy provisions. He says that the high rate of acquittal is basically due to other factors. And what are those? The obviously delay in lodging the FIR, witnesses' complaints becoming hostile. Right? This is the first point. This is the second. Then three, absence of, uh, you know, proper scrutiny in cases before the prosecution files the charge sheet because the charge sheet is not filed well, right? That's the idea. Now, why this, uh, you know, thing is coming in news again and again, right? Uh, it is because of the fact that the 2018 act was nullified, uh, right? Uh, right? This, that is the before uh, this act was again, you know, renewed by the government. Right. So the act was nullified by a 20th uh, March judgment of the Supreme Court, which allowed for anticipatory bail to those booked for committing atrocities against SCs and STs. OK, but the government says it is a failure of the police, the prosecution to render justice right to a section of society which has suffered social stigma, poverty and humiliation for centuries. That's that's the idea. Okay, so let's look and detail what was the case. Uh, so the case was Subhash Kashinath Mahajan was the state of Maharashtra. So please uh, commit to memory, right? This is something that you should remember. So the court removed the provision for automatic arrest of those arrested under them. So normally what used to happen as soon as a VCST act was his act is applied to a person, he is he's basically he's, uh, arrested, right? There's no provision for bail. Uh, the mandatory for the police to conduct peer inquiries between seven days. And obviously, arrest in case of public servant is prior permission from the appointing authorities has to be taken, right? But in the case of uh, private citizen, what did the you know Supreme Court say? They take permission from the FP of a district. Okay, so this was a big problem, right? Um, so uh, let's look at what are the idea behind. So there are a lot of cases which are going against the Dalits, and we look at in those as well. So. What the Dalits are saying, the, they, the Dalits have accused successive governments of failing to protect them. Okay, so that was the basic idea, right? Uh, that, you know, the provisions of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes at the Act is basically, obviously, not, you know, implemented in letter and spirit. So it's not implemented in letter and spirit. That's the idea. Okay, so uh, what uh, the people say, inherent power play is involved, accused is normally not only superior. So what is the other side saying? That, you know, the thing is that the accused is not only superior in caste hierarchy, but economically well off also. Uh, that is why an affirmative law is required, such as the SC and ST Atrocities Act, and this is required. All this would adversely affect the scope of the act to prevent uh, the commission of atrocities against SC and STs. And obviously, it is detrimental, especially because of a lot of heinous, uh, you know, sexual hack exploitation of SC and ST, women takes place, including rape, gang rape, acid attacks, etc. Okay, and if you remember, you know, Fulan Devi and, uh, you know, 
right? If you remember her story, oh, I think this is an example of that. The AC and AC women getting raped or gang raped by men from upper caste. Okay, so just to have an analysis of the cases under the SC and ST Act 1989 that has come up between 2010 and 16. So what is it? So they said that there has been an increase in crimes between 2010 and 16. That's the first thing again they see. Uh, the conviction rate and the pending uh, cases increasing and increasing, right? Uh, conviction rate is obviously was in more in 2010. Now it is even more less. That's 16 percent. So. Uh, in the same way, uh, against the uh, STs also, there has been increase in crime. Um, the pending cases are increasing, and obviously the conviction rate is going down and down. So this basically points to the police being being in cahoots with the obviously the perpetrator. That's the basic issue in this, right? And. Uh, if you think about 10% uh, of cases, uh, you know, against SCNC and the police investigation are labeled as false, right? Uh, so that's the main thing, right? Uh, okay, so let's go move ahead. Uh, so what was done in the Amendment Act, which you know came as a result of this uh, court case? So it says it basically put Section 18A has been inserted to nullify the preliminary inquiry before registration of an FIR or to seek approval of any authority prior to the arrest of an accused, say. So, preliminary inquiry shall not be required for the registration of the first information report against any person. That's the first thing with the 18 essays. The investigation officer sh shall not require approval for arrest if necessary of any person against, uh, you know, accusation of a, having committed offense and the prevention of activities act has been made. And no pr procedure other than provided under the PO Act or other CRPC, right? CP, uh, CCP 1973 shall apply. That is the code of similar procedure. And it also says provision of section 438 of the code shall not apply to a case under the Act, right? Notwithstanding any judgment or court or order, right? So basically, if you think about it, it is a tussle between the judiciary and the executor. That is the basic idea, so, right? So Okay, so uh, again, Supreme Court basically says that we will examine this because you know, and that is what so we would say the judicial review is the basic structure. And this is under the Keshwan and Bharti case is basic structure. So we will review anything, even if you think that it is correct, we have the right to review it. And this is under 1973, right? Keshwan and Bharti case. Okay, so the month after Parliament amended the Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribe Act, and uh, that was the 2018 Act, Supreme Court is examining its validity as two PLs are challenging the validity of the amendment. Because, see, it has been done against the judiciary. So, obviously, the problem is that obviously the judiciary feels agreed, right? And as a PIL, they take it. Okay, so what's the imprint answer writing challenge for today? It says the Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribe uh, Prevention Amendment Bill 2018 is a step in the right direction. But more needs to be done if scheduled tribes and scheduled tribes are to be mainstream. So the idea is that you know you're supposed in the first initially what you're supposed to do in this answer. You first basically I want to talk about the section 18a, which has been again put. Talk about the case, mention the case that is the case which has been mentioned under right here. Subhash Kashinath Mahajan versus the state of Maharashtra. Mention this case in here, right? Then talk about section 18a. And then after you've done so, this is so this should be the first page. And in the second page, you're supposed to basically talk about how can you mainstream? So what solutions? How can SCs and STs be mainstreamed? So that's the this is something I think you should basically look at a uh, framework approach like vessel or something. So basically, you need to obviously politically, economically, socially, right, technologically, legally, environmentally, internationally, and gender-based policies need to meet for mainstream of SE and STs. So that's the idea. Okay. Uh, the next topic we have is uh, the first past the post system and uh, what are the basic advantages of having a proportional representation system in comparison for first past the post system. So uh, very interestingly, what has happened. Uh, in this article, in case you have, I think many of you might have read it before, right? So it says the recently concluded midterm elections in the US received a lot of attention as opposition Democrats managed to decisively bring about a blue wave to capture the House of Representatives, flipping at least 37 uh, representatives in the state, right? 
So uh, interestingly, uh, J Democratic Janet Golden had won 45.5% of the vote. His runner-up was Republican Bruce Pelikon, who won 46.2. Right, the rest was won by an independent. But typically, what happened was that in uh, Mr. Golden uh, trumped in the district after a runoff of second round, where second preference votes were tallied in his favor, so helping him trump his uh, right Republican opponent. So the idea behind this is: let me explain just to have, have an idea. So let's say you, uh, let's say this is Jared Golden, right, and Bruce Pelican. So let's write the names. So first round voting, so let's say they're 100 votes. Okay, and these are independents. So in the first voting, let's say he got 45 and he got 46, and this person got nine votes, the independent person. So okay. now, the idea behind proposal voting is that they will take a second preference also. So the idea is if neither of these candidates, if no candidates achieves 50 percent, that is 50 votes in this case. So the, again, what will happen, you will look at, you will basically say that this is negated or turned into zero. And these nine votes now have to go to either this person or that person. So you have taken the second preference for this, right? So what happened was uh, Jared Pelican, uh, right? Uh, so Jared Golden and Bruce Pelican, right? So Jared Golden uh, got the second round votes, okay? And that led to uh, the Democratic person winning instead of the Republican, who would have won if there was a first past the post system, right? So. Uh, so the idea, uh, though, Mr. You know, if you think about this, uh, you know, Amartya Sen has lauded the preferential voting system, right? Even before it was implemented in May, as ordered voting allows for a true majority of choice to emerge, right? Both in form of the candidate chosen as well as a reflection of views of the majority. Unlike the simple first past the four system, right? Uh, so in the first past the four system, the leading candidate can win an election despite winning a major minority of the votes, which happened in. Uh, US in 2016, uh, you know, Donald Trump won the presidency despite having less than 50% of the vote, right? And finally, what happens in this article, they, they, it talks about the fact that India also suffers the same problem that we have the first past the post system. In several states with a high number of effective parties, especially UP and Bihar, parties which secures less than 50% of the vote tends to win substantial majorities. Uh, in the past, this was mitigated at the central level by the need of coalition, right? Even if the leading party in the election fell short in vote share, it had to get support of the regional party to get the half pay mass. But 2014, what happened? NDA won the majority of seats despite only getting a share of 38.5%, right? So basically, uh, this, so the idea is that though the preferential voting system obviously is more complicated, it is worth considering in the long run. Right, that is what this article is talking about. Okay, I think everybody understood. So let's go in a detail. Let's look at a comparison. Right, so just very simply, uh, in the first past the post system, the country is divided into small geographical units called constituencies or district. In the proposal, represented large uh, geographical areas are demarcated as red right, constituencies. The entire country may be a single constituency. Right, uh, then every constituency elects at one representative, more than one representative elected from one constituency. Right, so you know obviously you vote for a candidate in proposal representation, you vote for the party. The party uh, may get more seats than votes in the legislature, and on the proposal representative, uh, every uh, party will get seats in the legislature in proportion to the percentage of votes that it gets. Then the candidate who gets election may not get 50% plus votes, right? Especially in UK and India, but in Israel and Netherlands, a uh, candidate who wins the election gets the majority vote. So this, I think, is I think the major uh, argument for the proportional representation is the fact that this majority view is basically seen in this. Okay, so why did India adopt a first past the post system? So if you think about it, India adopted a proportional representation system on a limited scale for election of the president, vice president, election of the Rajya Sabha and Vidhan Parishad, right? It is called the single transfer vote system, right? Uh, but uh, India adopted the first past the first system, uh, right? Because uh, it is a simple election system to be understood by the voters, unlike the proportional, you know, system which is complicated and you know at the time of independence we had a lot of illiterates and it would have been difficult to understand the proportional representation system 
and obviously the first part the first system gave clear choice to voters to either vote for the candidate or a party but in provisional representation system the voter has to vote for the party and then the candidate is selected according to the party list right so obviously the voter can actually in the first pass for the first system can hold him accountable right the person but in provisional uh, representation the party uh, is voted for and the candidates are elected on the basis of party lists so the voter doesn't know whom to do uh, hold accountable for the welfare i think it's very simple you hold the party but i don't know why they okay but that's the idea that okay uh, you can give that in your point also in the first pass the first system one representative come to power so there's no clash of interest and ideas in proportional uh, representation many representatives can come to power there can be conflict of interest leading to constant delays and fights in decision making and this ha actually regularly happens in the us so the first pass the first system was suited for giving a stable form of government right so this is the major reason i would say for india in first pass the four system the candidate works for the entire community not any specific community uh, right it basically leads to formation of a nation it discourages the candidate to get votes from you know one community right and that is the idea okay behind the proposed representation in first pass the four system having support of one community candidate may not be able to win the election that's the idea he need to need the support of various communities so it will help in building unity rather than dividing society so that i think is a major reason that he has gone for this but okay uh, let's look for the question uh, enumerate the difference between the first pass the post system and proportional representation of elections why has india adopted the first pass yeah, i think we have answered that uh, is it time i think that's the question that you guys are actually this is, can also be an interview based question is it time for india to adopt a proportional representation system for elections right okay let's look at the next topic uh, now that is us china trade war so uh, this is one of the most interesting articles a must read article i would say so breaking with uh, you know more than a quarter century of history the asia pacific economic cooperation organization was wrapped up at summit with no joint communique issued so this is the major headline today if you think about it its leaders principally led by the us and china clashed over the proposing wording of the document economic rivalry between beijing and uh, washington ha has basically fractured the 21 nation summit into two segments obviously what is the major reason for this obviously it's the trump administration america's first policy which under washington has led charge on unfair trade practices and basically you know what us has been arguing china to increase market access grant intellectual property you know protections for american corporation it wants them to cut back on industrial subsidies and a broad level they want to basically cut down the trade imbalance that they have right please note this i think you should copy this in your, uh, you know this for bottom line your notes okay then uh, vice president mike pence who attended uh, the on president behalf hinted on a strategic pullback when he called upon nations to issue loans that would leave them in debt trap with bg okay so basically indirectly he, you know they encouraging uh, you know defaulting of loans to china okay now on the other hand china is basically talking about the you know one road one belt in much more you know uh, strong terms in this okay now to understand uh, you know the what this clash basically means for the world trading system right it is constructive uh, to imagine that the mutual conflict so far the troubles began when you know both countries starting taxing 15 billion worth of other each other's imports followed by us slapping a 200 billion of china's export with a 10% tariff right which will basically be increased to 25% so think about this it was now 20 billion uh, you know basically is the uh, tax slap now it would basically become 50 billion that's a, that's a lot of money okay china unsurprisingly retaliatory promise to impose reciprocal tax to the tune of 60 billion dollars now because of this what has happened uh, imf is downgrading the global growth outlook for the year to 3.7% right uh, which is less than from the 3.9 earlier right and this will hit the global supply chain and shrinking trade volumes may cause company to basically look at new trading routes and partners so basically that's the idea that india should basically focus on this that now is our chance to actually capture the global supply chain multilateral now the next problem obviously we talked about in the video yesterday that you know wto is losing its authority 
right? Interlocking system of bilateral trade treaties, punitive sanction networks may substitute the consensus-based approach, which was so painstakingly forged after World War II, right? And Asia will be at the heart of this attrition, war of attrition. Why? Because it has a strategic control of high-value maritime trading routes, right? And that is the key to the global trade dominance of China. Okay, so obviously the forthcoming G20 in meeting obviously is a chance that maybe this gets corrected. But let's see if uh, you know China and Donald Trump um, make the world go into a recession or not. Okay, uh, just to have an idea, have you already talked about it? But the tariff already applied in 2018. Tariff which will took you know effect on September 24 to 2018. Additional tariffs which will be imposed. So overall, if you think about it. Uh, this much amount of tariffs will be applied, right? Okay. Now, um, Chinese imports or tariffs have been applied on 50 billion. Now they will basically uh, apply on 160, so 130 billion there, basically applying the tariffs on. I think we'll talk about this, but just note this down. This will be useful in any answer on US China tariffs. Okay. Uh, but another objective type question can definitely come, right, about APEC. So just to have an idea, so who are the members? So Asian countries are members plus Australia. New Zealand, USA, right? Japan, okay, Canada, okay, China, right? Please note India is not a member, right? That's the most important part. Mexico is also a member, right? And so basically an objective type question can be made, right? So Chile is also a member. So basically it's Asia and Pacific. So Asian countries and the Pacific countries. Okay. South Korea is also there. So that is the other idea. Okay, and Russia is there. So that is like more important that Russia is also a part of a place where US is also, right? So that's the idea. India is not a part and that can be coming as a option in your big life question. Okay, now let's look at the next thing is the break deal. We have gone into it before, but we'll revise it yet again, right? So what happened in the pre-exit deal? So the idea is uh, what kind of deal can Teresa make great with the EU on the terms of exit? That is the basic issue, right? Uh, so the idea is uh, UK is scheduled to leave 11 p.m. Uh, on 29 March 2019, which can be extended, and that's the idea that let's you know let's not have a hard break, right? Uh, we don't should have a clean break because that will lead to a lot of economic losses, right? Uh, the, you know, but uh, Secretary Dominic Rab basically has already resigned because in because of the opposition that has happened, right, uh, to both sides. That the people who want, uh, the people who oppose the Brexit, they are people who basically want a clean break. So that is uh, the problem. Now, uh, the basic problem is the fact that how much money does EU, uh, you know, get from the UK, right? Because obviously there are some budgetary constraints which have to be met by the UK, even if they, so, uh, you know, leave. And then uh, what happens to UK living, uh, UK citizen living in the EU and EU citizen living in the UK? And that's another thing. But the most important, obviously, is the you know the 310 mile land border which runs between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Okay, remember uh, EU member, uh, the Republic of Ireland, and Northern Ireland obviously part of the UK, right? So neither sides wants to see a return to checkpoints, surveillance camera on the borders because it will disrupt the free crossing and trade. So. Uh, the idea is that they agree. You know, both sides want to buy more time. They want a 21-month transition period till December 31st, 2020, right? And um, obviously, the government has to plan for a no-deal scenario. What will happen if there's no deal? And what kind of, kind of uh, you know contingency plans will be made for this? Okay. And there are there other people who still want that? You know, there should be another referendum. And uh, there have been people like John Major, Tony Blair, and Jordan Brown who says the second referendum is a way to solve the crisis. Right. Uh, or the opposition lady, Labour Party is, you know, obviously divided over the Brexit because obviously um, if Teresa May fails to get parliamentary approval of the Brexit plan, right, uh, they're saying that let's have another election. Right. So that's another problem. OK, uh, then uh, just to look at, uh, you know, we have already talked about judicial day in, on, you know, in the video before, but let's look at that. So it says at present there are three 2.85 crore cases pending in the low courts across India, with states having high number of vacancies and relatively lower number of judges corresponding to the higher population, such as UP, Bihar, and Odisha. So basically, there should be UP, PC, UP judicial services, Bihar judicial service, and Odisha judicial services exam. And that is the reason why this is happening. Okay, uh, but 
uh, which are the places where there's low pendency, right? Uh, so if you think they have made a scatter plot diagram, in case you don't know, this is a scatter plot diagram. So what it says, fewer judges, fewer pending cases. Oh, uh, that's in Meghalaya. Me, right because obviously they have a tribal system jharkhand and chhattisgarh again tribal system so they basically don't go to court that much andhra pradesh and telangana very interestingly you know that's something uh, then more judges were fewer pending cases per judge uh, obviously punjab has obviously regular appointments of judges jnk and obviously mp but then we have the other ones fewer judges and more pending cases so we have you know odessa west bengal up you know it's like Thank you so much. That tells you why law and order in UP is not there. In one, you know, and this basically this diagram tells you in sec in a small second why is this, right? Uh, vacant judicial seats, Meghalaya, UP, and Bihar have the highest ratio of judge vacancies. Uh, UP has the highest rate of pending cases per judges as well, right? And uh, if you think about, uh, you know, all the both the you know, if you've seen the movies, Jolly LLB, right? Uh, especially Jolly LLB two has been put in UP, and that tells you why you know they have chosen. You know, uh, a case uh, in UP. Why? Because it basically, it's very difficult to get a case actually get, going to its conclusion in a place like UP. Okay. And then there are higher judiciary vacancies. High courts, Karnataka High Court, Telangana, obviously, obviously will have a higher vacancy definitely because a new High Court. Andhra Pradesh, Calcutta uh, is a very high percentage of judge, right? And uh, in Supreme Court also, there are six out of 31 sanctioned seats vacant. Okay, so let's go for Judge Fadi's paper three after this. Okay, uh, so this is an article. I think you should take some time and uh, think about it uh, and read this in, right? So what does it say? It says that uh, farmers were hit badly by demonetization, right? And uh, many were, millions of farmers in India were unable to buy seeds, okay? Millions of farmers in India were unable to buy seeds and fertilizers for their crops because of demonetization. And this is a report given by the union ministry itself to the parliamentary standing committee on finance. And it acknowledges, you know, official acknowledgement impact of demonetization. And he said, you know, PM Modi himself talked about in a rally that it was a bitter medicine to bring back the, you know, uh, money to the banking system and give proper treatment to the deep rooted corruption in the country. Right? Obviously, nobody is buying that anymore. It seems as if it was a money laundering scheme. Okay, uh, now what happened during that time? So there was not enough cash, right? Demonetization came at a time when farmers were engaged in selling or their kharif crops or sowing their rabi crops. And both these operations needing huge amount of cash with demonetization removed from the market. India's 263 million farmers live mainly in the cash economy. And millions were unable to basically, you actually, please note this, how many people uh, farmers are there, 263 million, right? Millions of farmers are unable to get enough cash to buy seeds, fertilizers for their winter crops. Even bigger landlords also face problems for buying, uh, right? And selling, giving wages to their workers. And obviously, uh, the National Seed Corporation, uh, it has already talked about, that 17% of the seeds given by the National Seed Corporation will remain unsold, right? Okay, so this was the idea that you know um, that basically gives you. On the other hand, if you think about it, uh, the labor ministry says uh, you know that it was an amazing thing, demortization. What happened was you know everything became formal. Like demortization revealed an increase of 1.22 lakhs and 1.85 lakhs jobs, right, in the total employment for the establishment with 10 or more workers, right. So basically, uh, everybody knows you know it basically led to formalization, but it hasn't really helped those people who are already employed that you know there's no point in having a survey like this but anyhow and that uh, farmer distress is a very very important issue in one of the three of the five states that is Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh so I think this uh, can be used by the opposition very very strongly if they want to actually win the election but you know sometimes the opposition doesn't want to win that also okay uh, the next topic is the Pradhan Mantri Sahaj Bijli Har Ghar Yojana, there's a Sobhagya, right? Uh, so the Sobhagya scheme is by the Ministry of Power, this we should know. Pradhan Mati Sahaj Bijli Har Ghar Yojana, please you should remember this, uh, you know, the whole, right? so every village has access to electricity and soon every household will have to, that's the idea behind this. And this is an ad today. Two crore uh, households have already been electrified and every household will be electrified before March 2019. And uh, the International Energy Agency finds Indian rural electrification as one of the greatest success stories this year, right? 
so be it difficult mountains, dense forests, or remote areas, Sobhag is reaching every household. And what they've also said very interestingly, did you get your electricity connection? If not, visit the nearest electricity camp or call on 1912. And that is something I think highly laudable of this government that they've given this. Right. Okay. Okay, so what's the objective of the scheme? Uh, is to provide energy access to last mile connectivity and electricity connections to all the remaining unelectrified households in the rural as well as urban areas to achieve universal household electrification in the country. And now nobody's telling uh, you how to pay for it, but okay, at least they're giving a connection. The electricity connection to household includes a release of electricity by drawing a service cable from the nearest electric pole to the household, right? installation of electricity meter, wiring for a single point, with LED bulb, and uh, mobile charging points. Right. In case the electricity pole is not available uh, from nearby household, right? So there's a reduction done. So with the inertia, we are also covered under the scheme, right? So this is very good. The earlier uh, the program has a similar objective. How is it different? So the earlier 24 7 power for all was a joint initiative with the states covering all the segments of the power sector: power generation, transmission, distribution, and energy efficiency, uh, right? Health of discoms, etc. Okay, so the power for all document contains details of various interventions recalling along value of power sector. Providing obviously connectivity to households is a prerequisite to ensure 24 cross 7. So obviously, uh, you know, Swapagya is a better systematic support to address the issue of energy access. But you could remember, the idea is that we have to give power to the household. So that is the idea. That is more bottom up in its nature than the previous one. Okay, so. Um, the imprint answer ending challenge. In spite of various initiatives, the condition of the power sector still remains one of the core challenges coming. All right. Uh, so try this answer, right? In K, right? And uh, please send it to us. Okay. Then we have uh, the RBS saga. We can go through this uh, in our videos from 2015 to 20th of November. Right. Um, just to have an objective question of 2013, the RBI regulates commercial bank in matters of. Liquidity of assets, yes, it does so. Branch expansion, definitely. Uh, merger of banks, yes. Winding of banks, yes. So all of them is correct, right? Uh, one of the most imp interesting, you know, exercises you will do during your preparation is looking at old prelim papers. Please spend a couple of hours, you know, every day on old papers. Okay. Uh, these are the three articles, uh, right, uh, by the RBI, right? Um, we basically, right, we're looking at um, what will happen. So the Reserve uh, Bank of India is set to get a major makeover along with its global counterparts. And we're going to have committees on various uh, aspects such as technology, risk management, banking regulation, supervision to assist the central bank in its operation. So basically, the idea is that we we'll reduce the discretion. So basically, what they're saying is actually it's easier to bend the will of 10 people instead of one. So the aim is to, you know, system of rule based decision making from the present discretionary based one. That is the idea behind doing this. OK, so uh, what are there will be another meeting, right? Uh, that is on December 14th, the next meeting by the government. And uh, the idea would be that we'll improve the governance standards of RBA. Right, but it could not be discussed. So that will be discussed that day. Then uh, liquidity facility to non-banking companies would be discussed on that day, right? And obviously these committees will be made and made sure that the governor will never get a chance to do anything, right? I think that's the idea. At present, there are no such committees on the central board, and the board will basically discuss the issue on the next meeting. There's a lot of chance of corruption now. I think. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead. Let's look at the next article, right? Uh, so obviously we, we have already talked about the fact that the RBI will now finalize a loan recast scheme for SMEs for a ticket size of 25 crores a condition which will ensure financial stability is not impaired. So that's the idea behind this, right? And the argument would also be that RBI should lower its capital now of 9% to 8% in line with internationally accepted Basel norms. Right, but the board has left it to an expert committee to determine the economic capital framework of the central bank, including controversial issue, issue of transfer surplus. Right, uh, so that's the idea. Right? And the NBFC and governance issue is specifically going to be done in 14th of December. So that's it. Okay, then we have a very, very interesting article by Arun Kumar, and um, he says uh, the article title is Amidst Institutional Decline. And he says uh, the issue today is whether a dishonest system can be managed honestly.
Uh, okay, let's continue. So he says uh, there have been allegation of interference in major institutions. So CBI, that's the first one. The top two officials in chain of command accusing each other of corruption, right? Then the fight uh, against you know graft in the country has been set back because of this, because now the CBI is himself fighting. So West Bengal and Andhra Pradesh are saying we are not letting the CBI come in our state. The deputy governor RBI has highlighted the seriousness consequence of this erosion of its autonomy, right? And he says the autonomy is a safety belt for the government. The intervention of Supreme Court in the CBI also places a question mark on the independence of the CBC and the functioning of the government in making key appointments in the CBI. So basically, CBC also there. Then we, have, you know, uh, the CBI controversy has left an imprint on the Intelligence Bureau and the Raw, right? Uh, so the NSA is also involved in this controversy. Then we are having the hashtag Me Too uh, going on uh, across media and entertainment, right? Uh, the election commission also is under cloud of announcement of dates, right? That happened last year, right? Uh, that action was taken against Delhi legislatures and functioning of electronic voting key, you know, machines. So all institutions, he's saying, are declining. Then there has been an attempt to introduce a civil services rule in central universities to erode autonomy of academic. So that also is mentioned this. This is a very interesting one, right? Um, you know, how to control academicians from not writing in uh, newspapers, you know, make them a part of civil service control rule. Now they cannot write against any government in power. The crisis in the, the banking system and non-performing assets, you know, obviously has also impacted the viability of the banking system. So all this is happening. Right. So uh, then he talks about demonetization because, you know, if you think about Arun Kumar, he basically has written a book on black money. So he's actually the authority. If somebody would, should have been asked how to tackle black money, right? He's the person, right? People call. So he says demonetization brought about centralization, right? And a lack of consultation with important decision sections of the government. The chaos prevailed, and about 99% of the money has come back, defeating the very purpose of carrying out the draconian measure. And those with black money escaped, and those never had seen black money over to great hardship. That is what he has been saying, right? And um, so CBI in Brooklyn is no surprise. Political interference obviously has been always been there. He says, and you know the Supreme Court even has called the PG, you know, the CBI being the cage parrot. All right, uh, and the political opposition, uh, when feeling heats of various investigations, has always accused the agency of being its master's voice, right? And uh, the Vineet Narayan case, uh, basically in the 1990s, uh, the Supreme Court tried to insulate the CBI from uh, manipulation by placing it under the CBC. But that has not worked because since the independence of CBC itself has been under suspect. Right. So obviously that's a big problem. Remember the fact that CBI. So now the question is, should be that why is CBI corrupt? So the thing is, the CBI itself is an investigative agency, right? It is largely manned and controlled by the personnel drawn by the police force. And it is a police force basically doing the master's bidding, right? And they, you know, regulars themselves commit irregularities in routine and depend on the police to cooperate with them. So the, obviously the politicians cannot pull them down, right? And then obviously in the police, they are wet and dry duties where money can be made right in the first and not in the second. And being on the right side of the political master is lucrative. Now that's the idea. Okay, so there obviously uh, now we have a committed bureaucracy. More and more policemen at least are in the committed side, right? So the rule of law being submitted, uh, you know, subverted, and illegality is committed on the last scale, and that is the reason why the black money has increased. It's you know uh, he gives a figure now, Arun Kumar, right? It says black money has gone up from four to five percent of GDP in two thousand, you know, in nineteen fifty six to sixty two percent of GDP. So he thinks sixty two percent of GDP is black money. Can somebody comment and tell me how much that would be, right? So he says uh, institutions provide the framework for individual and systems to function. The breakdown leads to so, you know breakdown of societal functioning. A democracy is weakened and sense of justice eroded, and opposition is supposed to, sought to be suppressed, right? The tainted not only survive but also get promoted and damaged institutions, and that is what happens. If institutions are not strong they are said you know if institutions are not strong they are not respected and it becomes difficult right not to manipulate them okay so uh, the idea is that whether institutions are strong uh, then only honest can survive 
Well, individual corruption is abolition when it weakens, but when it becomes generalization, so typically the overall collective interest suffers, right? Uh, so we we already had an honest prime minister tolerating dishonesty under him. The dilemma is today we have a dishonest system and can it be managed honestly? That is the question. Okay, uh, then uh, we have another article on the RBI. Uh, it's basically the same article I read. So I'm going to skip this, right? Please go through this article. If you have any doubts on this article, ask us, right? Okay. Okay, let's look at the next topic that is 3D printing. And um, very interestingly, this question has come twice. So in case you don't know, in UPSC 2013, there was a question on advantages and disadvantages of 3D printing, right? Uh, now, what is 3D printing? If like I want to is, you know, explain to you all. So basically, uh, the idea is that uh, you uh, first basically make a CAD design, right, or you know, right, or any kind of software design of a object. And uh, what happens is, normally, what happens is the subtractive manufacturing happens. So basically, you have uh, you know overall cylinder, and from that you basically uh, you use a chisel to chisel uh, the product into something. Let's say you want to make a cone out of it. So you chisel into a code. But on the other hand, what the 3D printing does is that you basically have this, uh, you know, dhancha, uh, uh, that is, right? And then what happens is basically what they're doing is that they're basically creating layers and layers of layers and layers and layers. And, layers. and they just fuse it to make the original product, okay? And this was basically done for prototypes initially. Okay, so here uh, Hemant uh, Kanakya and Sonali Desai, what, does, what do they say, right? So they say that if Make in India is to succeed, it needs to encompass this, make it the India way, okay? So it does not need the mass production technologies fueled by Detroit, right? Uh, or capital investment in Britain, uh, right? Uh, by massive capital investment or Beijing by cheap labor. He says that we can actually do it by destructive technologies. And the idea, he says, getting a image. So he's saying industrial 3D printing has begun to transform manufacturing in Western countries. 3D printing has not yet, uh, you know, obviously entered our, you know, everyday decks on. Even people who have heard it think of a toy technology to which geeks play with. And creating prototypes of robots, etc., using materials such as plastic, photosensitive resin, etc. Right, and this is seen to be an additive technology. Right, and think of Ford Motors cutting down the cost of creating new cars. Right from six months and several thousands of dollars. Now you basically think that this might really be useful for us, right? And as I talked about the fact, the traditional manufacturing basically, what does it happen? You make a mold, and that is what I was talking about, making a mold here, right? And then stamping out parts by the thousand, say, right? And obviously, uh, you know, making these parts as molds is expensive, right? Therefore, the cost of the first hundred units is high. Per unit cost decline only if they're mass produced, right? And this basically shows uh, how this is basically difficult, right? So traditional manufacturing leads to high inventory cost of multiple parts that need to be produced and stored before being assembled. So this makes the design phase extremely costly and complex, right? And that is the reason why 3D printing is better. But uh, in additive manufacturing, as I talked about, the physical object is to be built, you know, uh, designed in a software. The design is then fed into computer machine, which build the object layer by layer. And obviously, this is very, very suitable, right, uh, for creating any kind of, you know, system, okay? Uh, obviously, uh, it's no longer geeky, and that's what it's saying, right? And then, obviously, in this article, uh, he's talking, he's going to talk about how this basically can be used in India. So, obviously, why it is not so long geeky, right? Uh, the additive manufacturing starts out a technology for nerds, and geeks try to build an arm for a robot or drone, and rapid progress has led to this, obviously, type of, Thing you actually being used everywhere today even adidas and nike may manufacturing them actually you know if you want to google you'll find a shoe being made using 3d printing right okay um although it obviously it is a very quick and cheap way of being prototypes it has gone mainstream now the biggest threat of this is you can even make a gun using this uh, recent survey says that USA uh, manufacturers also have made uh, around 12% using added manufacturing. An expectation is that 25% in the next three to five years will use it. And what are the various objects used in this? Uh, we have dental implants, medical equipment, smart of engines, entire bodies of cars. In some industries, uh, you know, the 
progress is astonishing and we are hearing manufacturers are using active manufacturing right uh, basically but the problem is it is decreasing reliance on assembly workers and bypassing the global supply chain that allowed uh, china to become prosperous so it actually can be seen as the us actually taking back the global supply chain and basically it would may well need to software based design platforms in on the west that distribute work orders to small manufacturing facilities whether located in developed or developing countries right and basically it will transfer value creation towards software design from physical manufacturing and this would basically imply that labor intensive manufacturer exports may become less and less profitable okay but if you think about it uh, this is actually very very useful for india why now first it eliminates the large capital outlay machines are cheaper inventory can be small space requirements are not as large so basically this can really go well for india right uh, then the indian software industry is well established and we are good at cad right so this can basically be really useful even in small towns right outside the major cities then it is possible to build products which are better suited for harsh environment conditions right so you can make a product which may be able to withstand dust and moisture prevalence and so it's basically more flexible you can change then a uh, fourth you know in a country where use and throw is an atwa retaining maintaining old products is far easier because now parts can be manufactured so basically let's have a old car and uh, i cannot get the part anyway if i can just get the design from online i can actually make the part myself okay so but now on the other hand if you have already invested heavily in manufacturing it is very difficult to move to this right uh, obviously the make it the indian way approach we advocate it private or public partnership and what we need to do is uh, you know accelerate research at our premier engineering schools and manufacturing areas and then we would need government support to provide incentive for distributed manufacturing in smaller towns and for it industry to create platforms and connect right so on the whole it's giving a very very decent uh, you know this i think it's a wonderful article a must read article okay now uh, with the combination of science and art and pinch of indian entrepreneur should it would basically create a manufacturing system and that will allow india to compete with the global manufacturing system so this is the idea behind this so a wonderful article i think we will get a, we're getting a lot of points from this okay uh, so these are just to have an idea what is 3d printing is 3 dimensional technology you we use cad in this this is a rapid manufacturing right obviously laser melting plastic synthetics ceramics and metals are used as the material okay just to have an idea uh, so what happens in this uh, an object you constructing obviously using a computer design right uh, obviously and uh, from that you know layers of layers of patterns are created of 3d object are created and finally your object is created right in this okay okay just a question which has been asked 3d printing an application which will follow me uh, so preparation of confectionery items yes you know chocolates can be created from this manufacture of bionic as you can actually see a video on this automotive engineering definitely right a lot of parts as i already talked of parts can be created reconstructive surgeries yes uh, you know you can obviously 3d print even a liver i think uh, data processing technologies yes right so all of them typically is the answer uh then we have an article on india russia to build stealth frigates uh, so a 500 million deal has been again put with russia to create two stealth frigates for transfer technology and this was goa ship yard limited with the russo boro export of uh right russia okay so just to have an idea and this will basically be uh completed by 2026 27 okay then we have the final article of the day today that is a reconciliation um, Martha C. Nosbo, and uh, you know this is actually a very very good essay for ethics. It's actually defining a lot of terms for us. So we're getting a lot of definitions from this article. So let me show you how. So he says uh, she basically starts the article with a question. She says, "How can we bring empathy and forgiveness into a conversation on terror?" Right? He says, "I cannot answer this question without dissection." he says dissection will help us see that empathy while often valuable is morally slippery and forgiveness also is a double edged ethical instrument so what does it mean she says that you know if i actually help somebody i am actually my ego gets boosted so there is an unpleasant air of superiority right and at the end of the day what we actually need is respect for others we need to be generous and obviously encourage people to seek reconciliation 
So now what she says is, let's define it. She says, empathy. It is imaginative exercise in which one sees the world from the other person's view or the group viewpoint. Okay. Empathy so defined is morally neutral. Skilled torturers will cultivate empathy for the people that you intend to torture because empathy shows them how to cause maximum pain on humiliation. So basically, obviously, you can use it in the negative side also. So he, she says, it is empathy to have, a, you know, if empathy is to have moral worth, it is to be combined with other attitudes such as respect and goodwill. So she says that, you know, obviously, you know, just don't have empathy, right? You need other qualities at the same time. That is, right? What are those qualities with me, right? So obviously, this combined with other respect, obviously, and good. And, you know, she basically gives the example of Ashoka here. She says, uh, she says that throughout history, cultural uh, pioneers have shown kindness and respect to non-human animals. And this decision to show concern, not based on a prior attempt to understand how these you know, animals see the world, right? Uh, and But nonetheless, empathy is seen morally helpful as flawed people work their way to towards respect and generosity. So even a person who is not that well respected can now be actually be respected and generous because there's empathy. Right. And uh, let's take an example for this. She is saying she says uh, we take all unfortunate. We have an unfortunate tendency to think of adversaries, whether in a personal divorce litigation or a political struggle. Right. She says uh, we basically, you know, are unable to see the other points of view in these cases. Right. In a political struggle, let's say ideological struggle or a personal divorce. So let's say in the gay rights movement in both India and US, there was a long righteous silence on the part of the straight dominant people that gays and lesbians are totally monstrous and unlike their own. And obviously it's a, obviously they, what they have for a female or a male is acceptable, but what, you know, a gay person or lesbian person has, doesn't have. The politics of empathy in which gay people came out and told their stories showing they want love, etc., and had parents and children, wanted human dignity has enormous success. And you know, doing away with the callousness and aggressive domination. So empathy itself is not enough, but can show, you know, the open the door to respect and willingness to acknowledge dignity. Right. Now Martha Nosmum says, uh, what about calling criminals? So is isn't empathy to the case akin to objectionable complicity? Now here uh, I'll give you an example, right? So I was told by a person, my driver recently, that he actually there are court cases against him and so on. And he actually met a person in jail who had killed 18 people. So I told him that, you know, I feel that, you know, people who have killed, you know, he, he has killed have died, but he basically lives with killing them every day. So I actually can, you know, I have a lot of uh, sympathy for the person that has killed so many people. So let's continue, right? Okay. Now, all gate legal tradition argue to accord criminals justice and respect their human dignity that the right to human dignity article 21 is still valid despite the fact you are a violent criminal right that's why kasab was given a trial because that is his right okay but that we should actually see them as human first and dissolving the hard shell of arrogance in which with most of you you know most of us would view voluntary so the idea that even the person how worse he might be he obviously treat, needs to be treated with respect and empathy Okay, so uh, the U.S. system of criminal justice hold criminal defense have a basic constitutional right to narrate their story at the penalty phase of trial in order to see a merciful penalty, right? So this is actually there. So that is the idea. Now, then what he she says? So what of forgiveness? Right? She's a forg you know, as you have forgiveness, here, please write this. Forgiveness is a waving of angry feelings towards sadness as a result of process of you know result of process in which the oh, you know offender confesses, apologizes, and promises not to offend. Now, you know, remember forgiveness is not, you know, maybe she's not talked about the fact that forgiveness is not just about being, you know, forgiving, you know, asking forgiveness. It's also forgiving yourself, right? Uh, the idea of forgiveness actually is understood in institutionalized Christianity where we have, you know, rituals of confession that you can actually do a mistake and confess to father, right? And uh, absolution and penance, lay the attitude of model on these rituals. So that's the idea. Okay, so the idea is that for, this is actually very, very good, right? The offended party waves angry feelings generally without waiting for the offender to grovel, right? So here, obviously, uh, you basically have to understand that forgiveness is very, very important, 
whatever one might think uh, of the religious ideals being involved, right? The human variant obviously is morally unpleasant. We are accustomed to airing politicians groveling before the public and promising not to do again whatever bad act they did as a condition of being restored to you know, respect or even favor. Right. Do you think actually it is good or basically it's just a sense, a pretense of virtue on the part of the offended? So that is the major problem of forgiveness a person, right? Is it actually the person is groveling or maybe he's actually sorry? Is actually there is a remorse or he's just lying? Okay. So uh, far more obviously promising, as I talked about, is the attitude of unconditional forgiveness that we obviously find in Christian gospels and Jewish traditions, right? That, you know, you typically, um, you know, forgive without accepting, uh, you know, even letting the person, you know, having any remorse. St. Paul remarks that we ought to forgive unconditionally because in doing so, we would, right, uh, when we, you know, do this, we'll heap coals of fire on our head for our enemies, right? That's the problem I'll have with even forgiveness of unconditional type. And there's a further question of whether it is virtuous to keep our feelings of anger and hatred. Perhaps one should not have them in the first place. Okay. Now he says, she says that what seems to a lot better to me is an attitude which combines respect for basic humanity, which generous openness for the future, acknowledging past, uh, you know, wrongs, but not defining them as eternal sources of division. Instead, looking for a future of cooperation and reconciliation. Right. She says, in my own nation, uh, a bitter civil rights struggle was there. And there was still a great anger towards the white oppressor. Take the example like of Gandhi here. So Gandhi actually taught Indians, uh, right, that we will not hate the British, despite the fact that you know they have actually done the worst to us, right? And uh, somehow that has turned into hatred towards Pakistan, but anyhow, and towards Muslims. Okay, but I am with Martha, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. The anger that people bring to a movement to justice needs to be purified and gel, you know channelized, keeping the words uh, spirit of encouragement protest against wrongs, but getting rid of retributive desire to bring offenders low and make them suffer, right? Instead of retribution, he argued faith and hope. He, and the hope that will include, right, idea of reconciliation, even with those who have committed great wrongs. The attitude was not weak, as the critics said, it was strong and courageous. And King had, you know, basically uh, resisted the most powerful human impulse, the retributive impulse. Right for the sake of future of right cooperation. Okay, so in this, you know, actually, what happened, you know, if you want to understand this, is basically uh, forgiveness actually purifies the soul, right? It frees you from a cycle. So that is what you know the idea behind unconditional forgiveness is that what is done is done, right? So now we need to move on. Uh, attitude King recommends is often assisted with sympathy. Instead of building walls in our imagination, we need to tear them down. And reconciliation is greatly promoted by a difficult spiritual exercise. Sometimes reconciliation with the individual criminals proves too much. But we can always move up into the future without a hatred for a group of or a, you know, people. And King said, uh, I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with the vicious ra rapist, racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words interposition and nullification, one day right here in Alabama, little boy and black girls will be able to join with little white girls and little white boys as sisters and brothers. King did not ask his followers to love that governor, right? Uh, remarkably, you know, obviously, he... Uh, you know, George Wallace actually, you know, underwent a religious conversion and renounced his racist ideas. He says, let's prepare for a future, you know, where, where our children can, you know, play together, right? The generous vision is, uh, your vision is that larger than forgiveness, which is about, you know, oneself, building a future which requires stepping out of, you know, uh, the self with imagination, courage, and hope, right? Okay. So very interesting article. We actually got two things: empathy. We got empathy, uh, right? That it should always be with, you know, um, respect, right, and dignity, right? We should have goodwill, and we also talked about forgiveness. And so, two our thoughts coming from this, right? Okay. So thank you so much uh, for being with us. Uh, please uh, join our Telegram channel for the PDF lecture box. Thank you.